Center Mauritius, New York. It is the 10th of March, 2004. It is approximately 3.30 p.m. The interviewers are Wayne Clark and Mike Russert. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? Uh, my name is Bernard Scharfman. S-C-H-A-R-F-M-A-N. Uh, my date of birth is January 8th, 1920. I am 84 years old and never thought I would live that long. I don't expect to live much longer. Uh, I'm sure you will. No, I'm well, not. Where were you born? I was born in Brooklyn. Uh -huh. Okay. And uh, raised in Brooklyn, strictly a Brooklyn man, till I came out here. Okay. Um, do you, uh, what was your educational background prior to entering the service? I was a graduate from the, uh, Jesus, what the Baron D. Hirsch School of Aviation. That was in Manhattan. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh -huh. um, do you remember where you were and you, your thoughts about uh, Pearl Harbor when you heard about it? I happened to be one of the unique ones that was in the Army at uh, Fort... Uh, Camp, uh, you know, uh, Upton. Camp Upton, uh -huh. and my folks were visiting me. I had been there for about uh, two weeks, and my folks were visiting. So that's a tragedy in itself. What happened after they left, I just remembered, they brought in the uh, ones that were at Camp Upton, the permanent army fellows. Now, <clears throat> I hate to admit this, 90% of them were drunk, couldn't stand on their feet even. We had to dress them, give them their guns and ammo, and send them back out. <clears throat> I, mean, I, need, I should have something you. to drink. Yeah, I'll get you a glass of water. A uh, gin will do. Uh, uh, so they... Uh, Went that out. A few people remember, the, and you're as old as me, they were put out in the utilities at the station, at the telephone company, electric companies, and stuff like that. There. Mm -hmm. Well, I stood in the uh, camp up probably another uh, two weeks, you know, getting uh, training how to march up and down, all that stuff. And then they sent me to um, Fort Bragg, North Carolina for my basic training. My basic training considered, uh, considered of doing the, uh, one of the 155 howitzers. Mm -hmm. We took turns on different positions, you know, throwing in the ammunition and all that there. So you were being trained for artillery then? <laughs> Most of us were because that's what the equipment they had in those days. <laughs> Later, uh, then, I got, after that, when I graduated and stuff like that, I got sent to uh, Fort Meade, Maryland, with a small group of men. Uh, at Fort Meade, uh, Maryland, we got there, I think it was a, uh, a Saturday night. <coughs> I, sh I shouldn't be doing this interview. I can, when I start thinking about it, I'm not only coughing because of anxiety, but I get all choked up just remembering the th things I went through. We happened to be put into the tent right alongside of headquarters. This is company headquarters, headquarters company. And uh, that is pretty bad there. My advice to the future volunteers: <laughs> don't stick, uh, don't go into the uh, any tent near, near headquarters because anything that comes up, KP and everything else, you're gonna get it. Oh yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, we I wake up the next day. That's uh, Sunday morning, and the um, there was it wasn't a street, you know, in Fort Meade. They had beautiful, uh, what do you call it, houses 
for the infantry and stuff like that. But we were intense. And it was the winter time. When I got out and took a look on the outside, it was littered, littered with uh, alcohol bottles. So I, I figured this was my army <laughs> going into them. <coughs> That's drop you. Uh, Camp Maid was pretty nice. I got to get to went to uh, Washington D.C. I got to get to the uh, Congress uh, meetings and stuff like that. I was very much interested in what's going on, uh, so I kept going in at weekends, at uh, whatever I could. But this is not. The, uh, okay, uh, we got our basic training uh, 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 and uh, we started, at uh, me, we started to go to schools. I t I, my, one of my first schools I went to was uh, communication, you know, Morse code, things of that sort. I was a failure. <laughs> I couldn't get the code, I, you know, fast enough. So I was a dropout. I've, uh, but the Signal Corps uh, instructor of my organization, uh, my battalion, sort of took a liking to me, which is good if you ever get any officers take a liking, a liking to something like me. Because I, I was really tough. I, I spoke back and stuff like that and got into an awful lot of trouble which you will hear later on. For, for Fort Meade, we went to uh, Carolina Maneuvers. While I was in the uh, school there, Morse code, I also took up cryptology. That is the uh, code and decoding. In cryptology, we had a small little, it looked like a uh, cash, cash register, but it was smaller, a little small thing there, and that's how we used to pu punch in the uh, letters that didn't mean anything when you got it. And you would punch it, when you put down the, the lever, it would give you the word in English that you could understand. That stood with me for the tall time that I was in headquarters. So that when we went on the, uh, I had to tell you this, when we went on the uh, Carolina Maneuvers, and on the Carolina Maneuvers, we all didn't have guns or anything. We were running around with broomstick handles. Uh, I had gotten, gotten a weekend pass. While I was gone and I came back late, they had had what you call a field command practice. And a field command, the um, higher headquarters sends out these messages in code and stuff like that. Well, my battalion had nobody to decode it. <laughs> that's what, that's, that started me off. <laughs> So I was when I got back, and I got back, say about uh, nine, ten o'clock in the morning, and I should have been back by, um, before uh, roughly eight o'clock in the morning. Nothing was done. I didn't, I didn't have, stay, have any uh, punishment at all. But I kept messing up like that all the time. And, after that, well, we went to, uh, let's see, where was my next uh, move? I think we went to Camp Hood. At that time, there was no Camp Hood. It was an open field and stuff, but we went to Camp Hood. 
over there, we did some more training in Camp Hood. We, did, we, had, we had set up a commando course. I don't think I should go into the, well, what it consisted of, but it, does, it consisted of going up a cliff and stuff like that. Then coming down on the other side through the, uh, they were throwing uh, pieces of uh, ma uh, made up bombs at, at you and stuff like that. And then you had the machine guns, the standard one, where you get on, go underneath the wire and they were shooting over you, you know, regular stuff. <laughs> That's that's where we got the training of the uh, a man that had once fought a uh, Japanese wrestler. I forgot his name, and he he he, he was a fighter, and he was one of our trainers there, and he taught us where to, the kick. In other words, kick him where it hurts the man most. <laughs> and that's what we practice a lot of. Besides the uh, using the bayonets and all that other stuff. When we uh, we had to go through it a, a certain amount of time because our timing was off. We didn't we didn't do it in proper time, so we were there. We also every once in a while went out at night maneuver. Night maneuver consisted of, uh, consisted of we'd make up our own Molotov cocktails and sticky grenades. I wouldn't go into detail how they're made and stuff like that there, but that's just where they had the uh, replica of tanks which are made out of stone. And we had to sneak up on it at nighttime and uh, throw our Molotovs and hand, uh, sticky grenades. All right. Particularly, I considered that we were well trained, even in the short periods that we went in on the, on the training. The uh, from there, we went to Camp Maxi for uh, Camp Maxi. Uh, what was it? Uh, California, I think it is. Camp Maxi. Yeah, that's in the Panhandle. We had it nice there. It was like a recuperation and a rest because it was a regular camp. We slept in beds for a change. Everything was fine there. And I got to work at, in the, uh, as a message center. Now, I was the aide in the message center in, the, in this place. But uh, I also fouled up all the time. I had a bad habit of reading all the confidential and secret messages. <laughs> this is and this I realized later on that I was doing work, and not only that, like any uh, anybody enlisted man, I would let the people, or the men, know whoever I met what was going to happen. Advanced information. Oh yes. Later on, I got sworn into intelligence. I didn't think much of it, because when I was going sworn into intelligence, it was like uh, being sworn into a uh, organization, like the uh, Knights of Columbus or something like that, <laughs> with uh, that I would uphold my duties and stuff like that with the threat of death. <laughs> now, I have to go back and tell you something about the 29th Division. It's something that you're honored with, because when they put out their battalion flag, they had streamers on it. They, a streamer for each battle is awarded to a uh, organization. Well, they had streamers on there from the Revolutionary War, the 29th Division. So that puts, gives you a little pride in it, although I wanted to get out of it. <laughs> Uh, at Camp Maxi, everything was swell and stuff like that. But I don't think they wanted us there because we had the ta uh, by that time we had half tracks and stuff like that. And in town, we were, uh, the tar, we were cutting up the, the roads there with the tanks. It, uh, it was nice there. After that, uh, we went to uh, Mojave Desert. Mojave Desert. 
I'm, I'm probably skipping, skipping a lot of running around that we did a, a after that. Uh, but Mojave Desert stays in my mind very well. I found out with all the training and stuff like that, they, they should have trained the generals a little better. Before, because the first maneuver we went on, we went on as if we were on a wagon trail. And we would uh, make the circle with the tanks and stuff like that, and vehicles, round circle, just like a wagon train. So I started to realize we're setting up our own death trap. Because water fire and stuff like that, this is the way it started out at our training. And the uh, Mojave training was was more, I said, I think, a better training for our endurance living out in the desert. We lived on the uh, canteen of water a day. That took care of all our washing, <laughs> mouth washing, and uh, shaving, and all that stuff. And it was nice. Uh, well, I, uh, I think I only got one, I got, yeah, I got shipped home one, once, I got a uh, pass for a couple of weeks out of uh, Harvey. Uh, I, ca I came back to my home in New York with a nice tan, black, and I could weather the, the heat, but I could take the cold. It was rough. I was glad to get back to Mojave Desert. <laughs> uh, from there, oh yeah, we went on a, um, up the, the camp there, Fort Lauderdale. You, know, you remember that camp? Anyways, that was a rush period for us. It, 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 the, the camp there was formed around a big lake, and uh, we had, um, eight men to a cabin, like it was a semi-cabin. In other words, the sides were wood, and the top was canvas like a regular tent. And, and, and that was a real rest camp for us. I, I, I got to go home once from there. Uh, and then, and then after that, uh, where else did we go? Any, anyways, we got shipped up to uh, camp. I forgot what camp. I <coughs> Maybe it was Kilmore. One of the camps in New York State, ready to be shipped overseas. The, uh, gave us, they gave us a two weeks pass before we were shipped overseas. On this there, I must tell you, because something happens later on that I have to bring in this there. We were, I was invited and a few more of us to a wedding. One of my uh, companions had in Brooklyn. At this wedding, he, he was one of these fellows there. He looked like a movie actor, nice and tall, everything that I wasn't. And, and he got himself a beautiful bride. He got married that day, and the next day we went overseas. I have to bring this up to you because later on I'm going to talk about it. We went overseas in an English army transport. Now, an English army transport. I didn't think they took much care of their men, so you've got to think of how they're going to take care of us. We had this situations of the guys actually starving. One man died going across seasick. This is, you know, I got to keep swearing all the time. This is the truth, so help us. While we were loading on, I saw fresh fruit, food, meat, and stuff like that going on the ship. This is the truth. We got none of it. We didn't even get, we got a little mutton. We got the kippers. 
And I love kippers now. But then, I don't know what they did with it. They, didn't, they, they don't make it like I, uh, I do. Anyways, we couldn't eat it. Most of the food stunk anyways. What we used to do, we used to steal whatever we could. We stole potatoes. We ate raw potatoes on that ship. So I started to figure out, well, I got to do something. And I got on the, uh, as a gunner, this ship had on the tail end of it a, a sitting gun that you could not maneuver, a cannon. In other words, it was stable, anchored to the back. And I got on that crew. Now, on that crew, we were what the English call chit. You got a chit for food and for your tea and stuff like that. And we wrote chits. <laughs> that was what we ate. The, uh, they made up little sandwiches for the tea and things like that. And that is how we stood alive. It was rough. Most of the guy and only hammocks. That was our bedding. And we weren't used to hammocks. So a lot of us slept under the staircases and stuff like that. Okay. We get to England. We end up in, uh, what the hell town is it? Anyways, that's the town where the Germans used to come over and drop the bombs. They used to know the town by the, the uh, big building they had there with a bird on it. I, I, for, I forgot the name of the town. Uh, and the story that I'm telling you about where they were dropping the bombs is the longshoremen started to tell us what, what was happening there. Uh, this, I only got, so far, I got, got, uh, got to England. In, in England, we got stationed in, in the uh, English army camp. Just us, the Americans. We lived in Quonset huts with the uh, belly stove in the middle. In, in the Quonset had, they had no bathrooms, of course. We went in what they call the, uh, they had a nice name for it too. Uh, outdoors with a pot sticking out, uh, uh, underneath it there. I forgot, oh, honey. They called it the honey, uh, honey something or other. Yeah, I have to tell you these things because I remember, you know, so the, you can understand even before com combat and stuff like that, what we went through at the beginning, the early birds. In England, I was still attached to the, uh, Mission Center, so I'd go picking up the mail. Picking up the mail, I, I had my own Jeep uh, there, and I would pick up my mail. We were attached to the 1st Division. The 1st Division, I can always remember picking up the mail. It was like in a castle. All the way ba uh, back, you know. The wealthy people of England did very well, I must say. When I, I got there, I, my, the mail, mail clerk that had our mail and bags, you know, for the battalion, my job was to separate it company-wise. When I picked up my mail, the, uh, the mail clerk there told me, would you like to meet Roosevelt? So I said, Roosevelt, the president? He says, no, Cameron Roosevelt, he is the general of the artillery for the 1st Division. I met him. <laughs> These things you, you never forget. He was a nice man. He shook my hand. He asked me what happened. I'm in and stuff like that. And uh, that's what I did most of the time. Then we had before the invasion, if you people remember, you see it in a lot of Eisenhower greeting the paratroopers before they went over and stuff like that. Well, we didn't get Eisenhower. 
วีกัดมันก้ามอย่างนั้นอันลงวายโอ้ย before we cut มันก้ามอุ้ย we cut the coast guard as if we were infantry showing us what they're going to do with the landing ships and, th and things of that sort I, we was at Alice in England for about six months being that I'm Jewish when the Jewish holiday came along we got spent, we got sent to uh, Bournemouth through Passover holidays Passover holidays they put me up in a hotel that there was a movie made with David Nevin separate tables You know, we, so we were honored to be in, in, in that hotel. But I was surprised. Most of the English soldiers that were there were not English. They were Polish. Polish and a couple other foreign languages that uh, escaped and got into the... They, they were, and they were the pilots. I got to know some of them speaking Jewish. Okay, so, uh, after that, we hung around a while. Oh, yeah, we went up. We did some firing on, uh, up north on the cliffs there. It wasn't the cliffs of Dover, but it was something like it. And we did the uh, uh, firing on a uh, toad. Told guns, uh, told targets, and also stationary targets. So when I say we were well trained, we were uh, well trained. And I'll skip back. I, even on the uh, while I was in the states, we went down to the uh, coast, the, uh, where the Gulf of Mexico is, and we did uh, firing uh, 50 caliber machine guns on a towed uh, sock, wind sock, that was flying uh, by a biplane. Who the pilot was a woman. <laughs> they, they let us know in advance so we shouldn't shoot her. <laughs> yeah, I did, a, I did an awful lot of training and when, uh, we, let's go to D-Day. They transferred us to uh, Stonehenge. Stonehenge, most people don't know that alongside of Stonehenge was the English paratrooper camp. Of course, I'm a very friendly soul, so I went over there, got to meet some of them. I used to do a lot of things on my own. And uh, I, I, I met some of them. Now, people don't know what was happening during when we were getting ready for the invasion. A couple of miles north of Stonehenge, they had set up a uh, what they call like a gate right across the country of England and nobody was supposed to come through in, uh, in other words well that gate wasn't set too well because the girls from London got there <laughs> if you know what I mean and if, if you've been to Stonehenge you know there's like a little forest there and that's where, where we were in with the girls and everything else. It was, the, uh, the, we had a good time waiting for the invasion. When the invasion, uh, we were still there after a couple of days, and then the invasion happened. The only way we knew about the invasion was the planes coming over. That was the greatest armada that ever flew, continuously, all night, back and forward. I thought by the time we get there, there would be nothing left, but it wasn't so. The next day after the invasion, we got sent to Weymouth and put on the uh, LSTs. We, co we crossed the LSTs, but what happened was we found out, I found out later in a convention that A Company 
left, went out a couple of miles and had to go back. They didn't come, come in until about 12 days later. So I don't think that was one of the reasons we didn't get recognition as being in the invasion, although we were part of the, the um, fleet that came for the invasion. We sat up on the uh, LST for two days. While we sat there, the German planes came in. But they couldn't do much with their bombing. They had a bomb too high, and the, uh, the uh, blimps that they had tied to the LSTs kept them off. So we didn't get machine guns or anything like that. While we were sitting there, the uh, ducks, which is a, a, a ship that carried all the ammunition and things, was going up and by. I didn't get to see too much of the uh, D-Day, all the stuff that was loaded on the, car, on the uh, beach, because they kept cleaning it away after uh, D-2, and stuff like that. Then when we landed, our, t our tanks had a, the, a funnel built on the rear, so for as an exhaust, because when we hit the water, we didn't, uh, we, uh, we didn't know how far we were going to go down. So most, all of our tanks came through. The engineers had already found the water on the way up the cliff. I came in with the uh, 29th Division, Omaha Beach. So you, you can get an idea of how we came up alongside the cliff. And it was all the engineers had marked out the uh, mines. We, came, uh, we went in a couple of miles, sat there for a couple of days. Then we moved up again. We, I know we had two, two movements. I, about the second movement, I went up to the colonel and I told him I went out of headquarters. I want to go into action. The reason I did that, my motorcyclist, one got his head chopped off on the wire that they ready to cross the road. And, and the other one, this is all National Guard. I got to keep reminding you about National Guard. Kept a uh, head grenade hooked onto his jacket, and the pin was to pull out. So when I lost these two guys there, I, I can go back and tell you, way back, during the Carolina maneuvers, I went with them to steal watermelons. And this is the first time I got shot out, shot out with a shotgun by a farmer. So you see, these things react on you. Uh, so they, they, they put me in reconnaissance. I'm broke, I got no lack at all. They put me in reconnaissance. Recon, they put, they put me in demolition. Now that's one of the schools I went to. When I was at AP Hill, Virginia, I went to Fort Belvoir and took some demolition training. In demolition, I didn't do much, you know. We uh, uh, there was uh, much, you know. Uh, I, I did a little uh, with the uh, minesweeper and things like that. N nothing uh, much, but when uh, uh, oh yeah, we op we we stood there. We got hung up by St. Lowe. If historians will know that St. Lowe is where 30th Division lost most of its men. I had gone up one day with the uh, supply truck to bring up the gas and ammunition to one of the tanks. One of the tanks, when he came, we passed, was knocked out. And, uh, 
enemy fire started to come in it, but I had gone in front of the, the, uh, the supply truck. So when the fire came in, the uh, truck left me. The truck left me, I started to walk back a couple of miles. As I was walking back, on the left-hand side, I saw a cow with his feet up in the air. After that, I saw medics. When I saw medics, I saw all the bodies laying there. I started to throw up. One of the medics gave me a shot. He says, this will keep you calm for a while. He gave me a shot of morphine. And I laid down on the side of the road. About four hours later, I got up and I started to walk back. I walked back, when I get to the, back, back there, in the corp, the uh, hedgerow, this is the hedgerow uh, country. And in the hedgerow, between the hedgerows, they had the vines growing there. That's how they grew their uh, cherries there, whatever, to make calvados. Calvados was a nice strong drink. I think it was about 100% liquor. But in, in, in that one of those groves, the apple was watching movies. And I, see, I can't forget these things. Coming in like that there, and I sat down and watched a movie. I was hungry and everything else because I had thrown up so much. But I said, ate my K-rations, and, and, and the movie was Joan of Arc with, uh, who, that great uh, Swedish actress, uh, yeah, no, Bergman. English Bergman. Yeah. So I remember this, because later on, if I get to it, when, I, when they took me out of the hospital in a, in a uh, truck, I sat in, front, uh, in the front row one of these uh, shows, and I went up and I spoke to English Bergman. But I'd rather tell that later. So we're in uh, combat. The next, uh, later on, we get, uh, we get up to before Paris. We're up in the hill of, all, I think the town is the name of Orgon, overlooking Paris. There, there, by that time, I was nuttier than ever. So I get up to one of the guys who remembers me, still remembers me, because he wrote to me. He was on the uh, commander. A commander is the vehicle with six rubber tires and the uh, 37 millimeter turret on it. Those were the guy, uh, guys there. Most people didn't know it there. They covered our flanks. And most of the guys were nuttier than me. So I went up there and I saw, I saw this guy. He lives in Washington now, the state of Washington. And I spoke to him and I says, how about us taking a trip down there to Paris some night? That took guts. And he says, no. He says, when I get the binoculars, he says, I'll show you that there's two pillboxes right in front of the entrance into Paris. Do we keep talking? No, you what? Okay. Let me take, let me take a break. This is out of one of the books. It actually starts here. Called there. Can we have these? That's what it was. Oh, great. Thank well. you. Thank you. And I'm going to send uh, send your uh, the actually the load of books. Oh, and I only have just a page. My of pictures of one of the books. I should get it there. You can make a copy of it. Do you have the book with you? I'll go get the book. Is it here in the library? It should be in the library. Okay. The name of the book is Hitler's Last Gamble.
Okay, well, we can, we can get the, get that after the interview, and then you'll get yeah. the book, and we can... My you know. pictures of one of the books. All right, you can hold it open, and we'll take that's, a... That's in the bulge. Okay. Okay, all right, thank you. And, and you're going to be here tomorrow night? Yes, yes, yes sir. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you, I'm going to bring one of my things. Now, this is out of another another book. Okay. That's not out of my book. Okay. That's something to do with one of the uh, authors. I think Hank Keats wrote that book. All right, well, thank you very much. It was on battleships okay. or something. All right, thank you. All right, we'll see you tomorrow night. Yeah. Okay, sir. Thank, okay. thank you very, okay. very much. Okay. I appreciated everything. All right, thank you. Thank you. Before you put it on, did you get anybody as many as me? Oh. Yeah, you got, you got, you got the guys oh, yeah. to me? Oh, yes. We've done over 600 people. Yeah, but they, I, I, I go around and say, I'm the only one that did, did this, and, and I'm just not. <laughs> okay, we're back up again. All right, so we're up in the overlooking Paris there. We didn't go out there, but he sent me a picture also that I got of his, with his uh, vehicle, you know, uh, I didn't get to, uh, 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 on that vehicle, but I've got to tell you about this overlooking Paris. We stood there for two weeks, and then I find out the only reason we stood there was we had to wait for the French army to give them the honor of taking Paris. That was some... Uh, if the people only knew what how many deaths that caused by us, us staying back like that. But this is what it was. This war, every war ever since, has been a, a political war. <coughs> I made my <a> statement. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. So then we took Paris there and... Uh, we got stood overnight in the uh, park, the Victor Hugo Park. The Victor Hugo Park is a nice place there, and they got, I stood near the statue of a hand. It's supposed to be, I think, Pedaluski's hand or something with a pianist. That's where I, I remember staying, and I put on a show for them. Because I get all kind of bright ideas. I put it on a knife show and show <laughs> into a tree. But the only thing is, our knives were so cheap that they were made out of cast iron, the issued knife. And it would, if I did hit the tree, it would break. <laughs> so yeah, I'll, I'll bring up, as we go along, I'll bring up the idea of our equipment, and I, uh, we were far inferior to anything the Germans had in all their equipment. Uh, at this time, I can say that the uh, Germans had everything they had was better. Their machine guns, their uh, artillery, their, uh, they even had equipment that we didn't have. But they had been in war two years before we got in, so I can realize it. Oh yeah, while we fought in Normandy, I was, I was on the highway between the 30th Division on my right hand side and the English on my left hand side. And this is the road going up to Luxembourg and stuff like that there, or oh, Paris, where the uh, Germans try to break through. They put the paratroopers up against us, and that's why we were fighting the paratroopers who were so well trained and in, in the hedgehog country, I gotta go back to that, that the, um, they put the snipers in there. And one incident, they even had flamethrowers there, which nobody ever mentions. You would think only the American army, when you see it in the Pacific, were using flamethrowers. Uh, all right, but, but as far as I'm concerned, this was fighting over there in the Hedgehog country. It was the toughest fighting there was. Oh, yeah, and this is where we had, we were using Shermans. Tank destroyers was using Shermans 
with the top of the turret cut out. We didn't have the hatches on there and stuff like that. So what we did is we were putting armor, stripping the German tanks and stuff like that, putting armor on alongside and on top of us. We would put the uh, branches, tree branches, across there, and we put sandbags even on top. That's how bad it was with shrapnel coming in. So we'll get back, so that, oh yeah, and this is where we first used the, well, uh, welded to the tank, like fingers, to cut through the openings of the uh, hedgerows. That, that idea was later on used again when we, fought, uh, we start, got up to the Siegfried line. But that's another story. All right, we go, uh, we take, uh, we go into, uh, and uh, right now I'm running on the ammunition truck. The ammunition truck, I would sit and the, uh, the detonators. The detonators were in wooden boxes there in sawdust. But that's what I, I, I sat at, gone through the um, Paris. But the advantage was, this was the, uh, it's smaller than the half ton truck, uh, bigger than the Jeep there, one of, uh, one of those vehicles. And, and I didn't have the top on it. So I happened to meet some celebrities. One of the celebrities I remember was Kid Chocolate. Kid Chocolate, I remember, in my younger days, fought in Madison Square Garden and stuff like that. He gave me his picture. I gave him a pack of cigarettes. Cigarettes were what was the main means of exchange. But I had something happen to me that it was like a miracle. I don't know if it was some, there was a man standing, we would stop and go and stuff like that in, in crowds, you know. And one man, uh, civilian says to me, your name's Schaffman? And I says, yeah, this little boy, that's his name. And I think he's trying to put a scam on me. You know, and this thought would, you know, I, I got these ideas and thoughts in my head later, uh, later on. Stuff like that, should I have taken him with me? What should I have done? Was he a relative of mine or wasn't he? I didn't do anything, but it's always stood in my mind, things of that sort. Uh, we went through uh, Paris there, there wasn't much shooting or anything like that. Uh, get, we get to Paris, uh, fighting is on, uh, on the way, you know, uh, uh, stuff like that there. I think that's where we did the, I got five battle stars, but I can't picture which is which. In other words, I can say, oh, this happened in the bulge. And, I, and this happened during the uh, picture where we cut off a big piece of the German army. But I, I, I do remember where we had to stay uh, a couple of weeks also so the English army could go, go through. The English army didn't want to go through until we gave them an, arm, uh, an opening. This is when the uh, Air Force came over and supposed to lay down a corridor of bombing so the English could go through. In other words, create a path for them. But what happened was we put out smoke pots. The smoke pots, the wind changed. So they bombed us. Only one general of ours got killed there. That's what I heard. So that's the first time I got bombed. Uh, okay, the English army, they pulled through. So help me, I got, I got English friends. But as soon as they pulled through, I'm sitting in the tank, 
or I, was, I don't know if you remember the tank, they stopped for their tea. I'm telling you, I almost went over and told them what to do, war stop. <laughs> they had their tea and they moved on. And, and we, uh, we, this is kind of after, I think we formed the, uh, the fifth armored uh, spearhead. The fifth armored spearhead, being that I was in the demolition, and if you, you see on my head, one of these things are for 50 caliber machine gun. So I must have hit the mark and they gave me uh, something for the 50 caliber machine gun. Now the 50 caliber machine gun, they went and they put me on what is supposed to be a commander vehicle without the turret. Instead of the turret, they had a 50 caliber in, in a circle like. In, 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 in the circle, and that was my job with the 5th Armored Division in front of our uh, truck that had the uh, air, air tank and stuff like that there, so they could cut the saws or, or, or and things like that. And I was, with my group, was supposed to give them protection. Well, we pull into Luxembourg. First, we got word not to take drink or take anything before we got into Luxembourg, but of course, they thinking that's German and, and they're gonna uh, poison us. So not to take anything. We get into Luxembourg. I'm got more towards the center of the spearhead. The first thing what happened me being that it's me, some girls come over and invite, me, invite us over for a party. I leave the, ta the, uh, the vehicle, go right across the uh, Luxembourg where they had the gardens and stuff like that, over by the houses. And uh, at the ho uh, houses there, up on the first floor, these uh, two girls and their brother was there. So we couldn't, we, the only party was, they opened up a bottle of wine and we were drinking wine and things like that. About 10 minutes, I'm all, uh, just getting warmed up and the horns start going off, we're gonna move. I had to run back there, catch it on the fly and we're moving up. We, we move up and uh, in those days, as far as I was concerned, they had very few tar drones. This was probably the only tar drone going out of uh, Luxembourg City. Luxembourg City was a, uh, like, it was wide enough for single vehicles to go through. Probably today, by this day, they must have widened it. So they, uh, they go through, and I got, I, I, we get the signal to come up front. We come up front, they got the trees that they cut down to block our way. So they needed the air compressor with the saws so they, we could cut through. And then the tanks would push it aside. I, with my vehicle, go around through the forest and get in front of it in case there are any that are sitting down there who are you know, waiting for us uh, to give them protection. The truck comes in, and they didn't even start cutting. And a booby trap goes off. But we're lucky. It was black powder, and it wasn't too big of a charge. Well, the black powder let the Germans know where we were, how far we got. They get to work out it there, and I'm on, on the year 50 caliber, you know, facing away from them, because I want to see if anybody's coming in or any, anything and they cut the tr uh, trees down. So I go ahead, ahead with my vehicle out of the forest. I pulled out about a uh, hundred yards. Then the tanks start coming after us. The, uh, as they came out, 
the first round of a Duggan Tiger Tank on the right hand side in front of like a, a chateau or cathedral or something like that that's probably still sitting there, fired its first shot and only shot across my bowels and missed. Somebody called in for fire support. All the time that we were spearheading, we had fire, uh, fighter planes above us. They, in, a, in a couple of minutes, the, fire, the uh, fighter planes came in and dropped their belly tanks. I'm sitting there watching, so help me, most of the wall was like a movie to me. I sat there and watched the belly tanks come down in front of it and hit them. They dropped about two, two belly tanks and it went up on fire and stuff, stuff like that. Then everything started to come out of the forest. I rejoined, went, went the hell back. I am not stuck hiding point. Went back and got into the line where I was supposed to be. That's, that it was Luxembourg. After that, we kept hitting a lot of opposition and, stuff, and things like that. Uh, after Luxembourg, while we were fighting, we got our new tanks. We got we were, first, we were the first ones to get the M10s with the 90 millimeter. I got pulled out and sent down the M10s. I was on on the M10s when we got into the bulge. Oh yeah, before the bulge, excuse me. First, we were in the bulge. We were in a holding position over there, and we're doing uh, the red fire. It's going off. Yeah, the end of the tape. All right. Uh, 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 the air area in the bulge, we were doing night fi uh, firing. It was back in West Perry. As a matter of fact, that's where my first trip to Paris was from there. I got a rest period there. I'm not going to talk about, uh, about Paris, but I already had a date set for me there. And uh, when we got back, uh, back from Paris there, we had one incident that I probably might not, I really shouldn't talk about it, but the, we had a, disor a disorderly retreat from the infantry that was there, which uh, no American would say uh, that uh, Americans should retreat with this outfit did retreat, and I'm not going to mention which uh, division it was, but we had to move our tanks in front of them and threaten to kill them if they didn't go back. That's the truth, gentlemen. We, uh, after that, uh, we stood a, little, a while longer. They needed us up in uh, Hurtgen Forest. The big combat was going on at Heitken Forest. Got up to Heitken Forest there. Heitken Forest, if any, anybody was there would tell you, the Germans were doing indirect firing over there, hitting the treetops, and the treetops became shrapnel also. It, it was so close fighting there that that's the only place I remember where we, they put out barbed wire with tin cans sitting on it there in case any movement during the night time. We, stood, we were in we were Heitken Forest for uh, a, little, a little while, but the uh, 82nd Infantry paratroopers were fighting up in uh, Belgium, uh, not Belgium, uh, but the, uh, the bridge, uh, yeah, I was in Belgium. not, not a, gym, uh, a bridge, yeah. they were fighting uh, up there. So we were sent, sent up to give them support. So, uh, by the time we got up there, which is day and night driving, we got up there. That's the first time I seen a windmill. Well, once I seen that, we had orders to go back. They already took the bridge and stuff like that. We went back to Hurricane Forest, did a little fighting up there. Then I think the, uh, the bulge happened. Okay, why don't we stop here a moment? We still got a few minutes. Okay, we'll continue. The bulge, the bulge happened, and uh, we were put into the bulge 
with the 82nd, attached to the 82nd, that was in the rest, ca rest area in uh, France, where they had the cathedral and stuff like that, where the uh, army headquarters had been established over there. So with the 82nd, we, we joined up with the 82nd in, in, in the bulge. I remember the bulge very uh, closely because that's where I was in uh, with the 82nd where they got their shoes, the uh, winter shoes the, uh, for the snow and stuff like that. Shoe packed, I think they call it. Some of the guys from my outfit stole the jump boots. I was good enough not to steal it there because these guys, when they went to Paris on their trip, that ran into the guys from the 82nd there, and the 82nd made them take their boots off. <laughs> All right, we're going to stop here and change tapes. The 82nd? Yes, that's the third boat. But I have to go back a while, because uh, I, I'm still in the First Army. Now, I, I've got to tell you about uh, the First Army. The uh, First Army, as far as I'm concerned, was much better than the Third Army that I joined later on. In the uh, fi First Army, the officers there seemed to have some kind of care for, for the men and stuff like that. The off uh, mostly I'm talking about the higher rank officers, colonels and up. Uh, so that, uh, then I'm still in the First Army. My tank was different than all the other tanks, the M10s. We went and put a metal box on top of where the, the radiator is in, in, in the rear. We had it strapped down. This metal box was our, uh, we could call it anything, uh, our souvenirs that we collected. Mm -hmm. Well, we collected anything that we considered valuable. Like, we go to, to a town, a hit one town, I knew something about it, and I found silk stockings, women's silk stockings. That's one of the things when I got to Paris, I came back with. But I had to go, but these houses of uh, ill repute <laughs> to get the, uh, to sell the silk stockings. Most of them wanted to give me a trade. I was not that good. I couldn't take it all in trade. Uh, well, uh, the, the reason I'm telling you, if you ever see a tank, an M10 with uh, that box, we were the only ones to have a box like that while we were in the First Army. Now, I'll go back to the bulge. People must realize what a tank is. A tank is an icebox in the wintertime, an oven in the summertime. In the summertime, you sit in there in your shorts. And if you touch the metal, it's got hot, sometimes you get burnt. Mm -hmm. and that's how it, how it heats up. In the wintertime, especially during the bulge, it was freezing. So there's a, a picture that they might show. This picture is a, a, in a book about the bulge that was taken by uh, me by a, con a combat photographer that I never knew it was taken until somebody told me it was in there. And, and it shows me with, I think it's a sign the men from the 82nd Airborne, me sitting in front of the tank. And the top, top part, of, uh, there's two pictures on that page. The top uh, part shows the bodies of Malmody, which I had been in that area. Uh, so I know something about that. Uh, anyways, that's me right over there in the front. This is me, little me over here, sitting there, and as usual, I'm doing all the talking.
Okay, so you just move your finger. Right, and that, and on this end, standing is my commander. Okay. I commander anymore. I was the only one left in that tank. I stood in that tank. Well, I didn't stand. I got out of that tank for four days till they sent me relief. And then when they sent me relief, some of them I didn't want. I, this, and this is malady, the bodies. So when I talk about things that I did, I, I had it in my heart to do as much that I could. The, uh, like I was saying, the next day that I woke up, we had had a frost that night. I was the only one left. I hadn't been called up, because we used to stay on duty four hours, where we were sitting in one place, take turns, guard duty, sitting in the tank. And uh, uh, during the bulge, all of us was in the trenches. Either we dug a trench underneath the tank or on the side of it. I, if you, I can describe the, the, that. My tank was right alongside a railway embankment. On the other side, it was all German, all enemy territory. The only time I did go across, as stupid as I was, instead of taking the water and melting the water, there was a, a running stream there, stuff like that right alongside, and I collected a cup of water. But I realized I better not do it again. The, uh, the bulge, for me, was a hardship thing. It was all hardship, you know, with the cold and the food. Oh, yes. I must, here's another thing that I'll swear by. I had 10 and 1 rations. 10 and 1 rations, if you don't know what it is, it's good meals that we look forward to eating instead of using K rations. So I had about four boxes of that strapped out to the side of the tank. In one night, it was stolen by the 82nd. <laughs> God bless him. <laughs> but this is what war is. People got to realize everybody was out for themselves. And I, I, if they got away with it, I'm, I'm glad of it. It's all, uh, all right with me. Uh, then when I got to bed, I got, I got them that I didn't like. You know. When you say like, I mean, I couldn't depend upon them. For, uh, for instance, they sent me up one man from the Air Corps, a staff sergeant. I'm a, I'm a private now, commanding a tank, and they sent up a staff sergeant. And the first thing, and we were uh, sitting there cleaning the guns and stuff like that and getting ready, you know, for our next battle. The first thing this man says to me, gets out of the jeep, asks for me, by name, and, and says to me, where do I sleep? At that time, I had one answer for, the, for anybody like that. First of all, he comes up in uniform. I hadn't seen a uniform <laughs> almost a year now. And he says to me, where do I sleep? I says, get the hell out of here before I shoot you. So help me God, I never see him again, and he must be thanking me that I saved his life. That's, that'll give you an idea how I was set. Because I know I'd get no use out of him. If, if he's worried about sleeping instead of staying alive, I got rid of him. But then they sent me up some more guys and stuff like that I got along with. The main reason I got along with I did the cooking. I scrounged for food. I know where the Germans hid, hid, hid the food. All the sausages and stuff like that. 
the wash and things like that. So I'm not going to tell you in case we get in the war again. <laughs> We're going to go find it. <laughs> but th that's, that's what I... Every time we pulled up into a z position, any tank, any position, I was the first one out of there. Looking, scrounging around. I picked up my swords. I got two swords. One of them from the First World War. The second one, I, I saw a jeep coming, driving with a German officer sitting on the hood. You've probably seen it in movies and stuff like that. And I said to the guy, what are you doing to the guys? Oh, we're bringing them back for our colonel. The sword, I says, hell you are, I'm taking it. I walked over and took it. And the guys looked up at the 90 millimeter, didn't say a word. It's beat these things I learned how powerful I was. Not me, I was. The tank was. <laughs> you know? And this is, this is how I made my war. And I did things I'm, I'm, I'm ashamed of, but I did it because I had the power. I, I, I really, sh I can't tell you, because even now, if I said, I think it was Hurtgen Forest, the stuff like, I, I, I forgot, no, the Black Forest, which comes later. I, I, Lieutenant Colonel, with the badge and everything. First, the, I was on the second tank in line to pull out. The Sherman pulls out, he's about a hundred yards ahead of me, gets hit. Two shots, tank goes on fire. Everybody jumps out. It's snow. Some of the guys are on fire are rolling in the snow. It must have been a minute. The chaplain comes up with a white flag, and, and, and medics comes up, and we got every man out of there. The war stopped. This is the truth. Unexpected like that. The war stopped. They got every man out. This lieutenant colonel comes over to me, I'm the second tag, and he says, why didn't you move up? Anybody would say, Oh, we'll move up if you want us to. I didn't. I says, put the scouts out. Let me know where that anti-tank gun is. So help me God, I did it. We didn't move at all. We stood there that night. Next morning we moved out there. No opposition. Nobody got killed. I don't know if I can report it. See, by right, when you see it in the movies and stuff like that, a man doesn't do his talk from an officer, he's, he's entitled to get shot. This was at my war. I didn't get shot. That's why when I talk, when I talk to these interviewers, I said, they're not going to believe me. Nobody believes me. As a matter of fact, well, I, I was going to say, I never even got interviewed after the war to what I did. Uh, so then, that's, uh, then we, uh, I could, well, we went down, oh yeah. First we hit the uh, Siegfried Line. Siegfried, Siegfried Line is, we, it was a rainy day or a damp day, stuff like that. We pulled in a field before, before the, uh, oh, I'm going to die. No, the Zickfried line is a vehicle comes up, a Jeep, with a driver that I didn't know, calls my name, says, come with me. As usual, I get in there. I thought maybe he's going to take me to the rear, something like that, which has happened before. I missed telling you about the uh, other time. He takes me to the, uh, takes me, says, we're going up to
to the six feet line to lay out tank positions. I think nothing of it. I'm riding along. We get to a road, and the infantry. We're riding, the infantry is on both sides of the road, going up. And we and I'm talking about anything else but but the war. What I'm supposed to do with this guy? He was a uh, from Louisiana, one of those uh, tobacco chewing uh, Cajuns. Check Cajun. A tobacco chosen K Cajun there, and, and that's all I was known. And oh yeah, so we talk, we get to talking about Florida. He had gone into the swamps in Florida to build the Saratoga racetrack. That's the conversation. And he's telling me how tough it was getting out the palm trees for the Saratoga ra racetrack, <laughs> and I'm pitying the guy. Uh, we get we, we we get up and all of a sudden the infantry isn't there anymore. So we put the jeep uh, jeep on the side and we walk up. I don't see another soul. There, there's a bank of uh, like a hill almost, pretty long, uh, like an embankment. And if you look over the embankment, there's the pillboxes. The pillboxes was set up like you always see, you know, uh, one in front, one, one in the rear, another one in front, zigzag. That's, that's the pillboxes. The road ended there, right up to the that I'm back. There was no more road. I didn't know if anybody said the pillboxes and stuff like that. So we get up on top. We're walking around to pick out these positions. Friendly fire comes in, white phosphorus. It happens so, I'm wearing the red coat. And, and it hits right the embankment and sprinkles over us. I don't know if these marks on my face, these little, little marks are from there or not. But I do remember getting off that embankment fast and throwing away my red coat. Then I took and washed my face, and I even washed my helmet. We get down on the side, and we start to make noise, knocking in uh, pins, tent pins we took with us, and we were bending it in with the butterfly. I, I didn't have, I used the, uh, the little gun, the, uh, 45? Uh, carbine. I was carrying a carbine at that time. I, I had all kinds of guns in the tank. I had German guns and stuff like that. Anyways, I car carried the carbine because I knew I could get fast firing out of there and I could hit a uh, fire at a distance. And it's right. So we're digging and making a noise. The Germans opened up on us. They didn't know what the hell we were doing now. No, they heard this noise back there. And they started over this embankment shooting with a machine gun. And you can see it clipped in the trees. The guy with me was a very faithful Catholic. He got down and started a prayer. So, so I hope he got, he's praying, and I turn around and I say, pray for me too. <laughs> We finished our job, what we had to do, because it was really nothing to do. All you had to do was pull the tanks up there, put the gun over the uh, embankment, you know, and fire away. It never got, got to that. We never even had, uh, had to bring down the, the, uh, the M-10s. They brought down the Shermans, put the teeth on the Shermans, welded them back on again. And some of them, they put the shovel on. They broke through the embankment and shoveled them alive in the pillboxes. That's the way to fight a war. Bury them alive. And that's how we took the pillboxes. Uh, after the pillboxes, see, I get my battles mixed up. After, 
uh, I'm going to jump right over to the uh, Robbingham Bridge. Before the Robbingham Bridge, we took one city. That we, uh, I forgot the word you called a friendly city, where the German uh, were able to walk around and we were able to walk around in the town. There's, they had a word for it. <laughs> walk around shit. <laughs> I put my tag. I'm still in command now, as a private. I put, I put my tank across the main road over there. Main intersection. It was a beautiful road. I forgot the, the name, uh, name of the town. City, which got a big city. And we stopped everybody coming through, searched them, and took whatever we could. I had an armful, not a handful, an armful of watches. Oh, we were having a good time there. There was a bank. It looked like a cathedral with the big cathedral doors on it, sitting on the side. And I, I was eyeing it for hours. Then I said, oh, come on, let's get out of here. Let's see what they got in the bank. I took, uh, I'm going to end up in jail for this. I took the tank. I, I rammed it, put my gun around it to the rear, and rammed it with the front and broke the doors down. I get inside, go around looking, and I found a lot of Belgian money. Blue money. I forgot what, what it was, but it was a load of it. I'm sorry. <laughs> we took it, dumped it in the floor, and made a bonfire. It wasn't too much later I found out the money was still good. <laughs> That's how it worked. That's war. Got, got out of there. I forgot what they call that when you take a city, and you, an open city. That was an open city, and the uh, medics, from German medics, were going around picking up the bodies. Not that we did any fighting, they must have had them in the hospital there, stuff like that. Because I, we, I know I didn't do any shelling there or anything. It's... Then we, well, we moved on there. I, next big battle, as far as I, I was concerned, was the Robbingen Bridge. And the Robbingen Bridge had been right before, the day, the day before, and stuff like that. And we all picked, pulled into like a wooded area. A lot of grass and stuff like that. In, in early morning, about 6, 7 o'clock in the morning, daylight, we pull out. The bridge must have been already taken. When I got out there, there if anybody knows the Eurobican Bridge, there was like a highway alongside of it. Now, we did, the very, the, as usual, with the dumbest thing, we, we pulled out, you know, the ammunition trucks and stuff like that. Uh, I'm ahead of it. The, the Germans opened fire from the hills. There was like mountains or hills on the other side of the uh, Garbingen Bridge. They opened up, and first thing they hit is the truck with the ammunition going on all over, fireworks. But we kept moving on. We got on the bridge, the infantry was going across it, the uh, engineers had already put down uh, logs, or so, not logs, planks, big heavy planks and stuff like that, so we could cross it there. We got across the other side, we went down to give them the defense and stuff like that on the other side, got off the bridge. The next day, my friend, I won't mention his name, because this makes me very angry. When I read about the Ramagan Bridge and, and stuff like that, his name isn't even mentioned. His was the tank that fell through the bridge the next day, because he got stuck in the mud, his tank got stuck, and he couldn't get out till the next day, and, and hit the island. Him. And, and the assistant gunner got killed 
the radio operator and the uh, driver got out alive. I mentioned this because later on they gave me the radio operator from that tank, and I, met, I mentioned it. My friend came from a block away from me. So that I was very friendly. Every time I'd get a break, I'd go over and we'd talk, you know, and stuff like that. And so his mother was the only one I went to see after the war. And when I got there, I couldn't talk. I started to cry like a baby and left without saying a word. All right, so the Robinson Bridge, they shut down on us and stuff, and he came the next day. The following day, the first time I saw a German jet. I had seen the you know, rockets going over to England and stuff like that. But this is the first time, and I was on the gun when the jet flew over. They tried to bomb the uh, bridge. Because they knew how essential that was the only bridge we had over over that river. And very, everything was going to cost them. I'm standing there on the uh, machine gun in, in the uh, M10 and the jet. Uh, so I thought I'd be able to get a sight on it. I couldn't get a sight. It was that fast. I couldn't shoot off anything. But that's how I got to see the jet. Yeah, we stood there a couple of days, and then we moved on. You know, now that we were in Germany, fighting got tougher. In other words, everything we t had to take, we had to take mostly with a fight. Very few, we had very few towns gave up and stuff, and stuff like that. One town. This is where my, one of my intelligence comes in. In, in one, one town, it was at night time. I, I, I went through with it, it was like a skeleton. Every building got hit and stuff like that. Like you really do see, and this, this is what, what I saw. I go, I go through, I get orders for me to go back alone and report into uh, the, uh, Rat House. Rat House is the uh, mayor's uh, headquarters and stuff like that. That's the German word for it, I'm pretty sure. I come into the Rat House, and that's where they gave me the picture of uh, Martin Gorman. He was the secretary to Hitler. They lost touch of him, and they made up pictures. They figured he was trying to get away. This is way before they got the Hitler and stuff like that. So I, I got that. I don't know why they sent me. Anybody could have gone picking it up. And I went back. I kept that picture with me later years. If I get to it, I'll tell you how I went to South America looking for him. I'd still be looking for him, but I'm a broke-down old man now. And they still haven't caught him. You heard these stories before, huh? Some of them. You heard the same thing? Yeah. Okay, so I got the picture. We, we fought, stuff like that there. We, we, uh, oh, one town during the daylight there. Snow was still laying I, I remember. I seen a wheelbarrow with a German officer in it. The German officer was cut. He probably was being operated, nice clean cut, like that, laying in the wheel battle. They had to leave him, he probably died. But that was a sight, say, uh, that, that probably, the, one of the interviewers probably saw that, because everybody that was in that area saw it going through that town. Uh, Oh, I forgot to tell you, St. Lowe, all the way back to the bulge. It was my outfit that lost, was trapped, three tanks was trapped in St. Lowe for a couple of weeks. 
And if, if you want to check that one out, it was in the Stars and Stripes. They had a whole story about it. Okay? So while they were stra terror attacking it, being that I volunteered out of headquarters, they, they had got the idea that I had the uh, death wish. So they came to me. I should walk up the highway with a uh, minesweeper. I should walk in the center of the highway with the minesweeper and the other guys with the rifles and stuff would walk behind me so they could take the town. I didn't do it. I chickened out. They took the town without me. But I just wanted to know the guy, some of the guys in the, from that tank was hiding in the basement in the cellars there and stuff like that. A lot of them got out alive. That's one of the incidents I have to, had to, had to tell you. Even though I chickened out on I, I one of the other things. Now, the uh, Robigan Bridge, the, only, the biggest disaster was in the, in the road at the first few days that we went through. After that, it, there was a lot of wine. I stocked up, stocked up our wine. There, they had the red wine, wine <laughs> out there. That was the best wine I ever got in my life. It's better than the local wine we get here. <laughs> um, then we moved on, of course. There, like I was saying, there we had small battles and stuff like that. One battle I remember. It wasn't a battle. We were at this time. What happened was. They split us up. They put uh, three tanks, I think, or three of us, to a uh, division or regiment. In other words, they would split us up there. So I would be with the company. Got, got my uh, orders from the infantry. One, one day, they go, well, I'm up on, high, on the road or highway, whatever you want to call it, and there's a farm with an open field. And, uh, and they're going to cause like a charge, like you see, you know, spread out. All of a sudden, there, I got my, my tank sitting alongside the barn that was up on the road. Just the gun shook out. A shell comes out, I didn't know from where, goes through the barn, bounces off the side of my tank. I'm not used to that. <laughs> So we started a fire away. Not know where to, where to fire, but I knew the infantry wasn't in the woods over there. We started a fire, a firing away. And this was a nice warm day, and I'm wearing my combat suit. Combat suit, I don't know if people know what it is, but it's uh, like overalls with a uh, tank, tank jacket to match the overalls. Oh, I want you to know, at no time, did, we, did I wear a tank uh, uh, driver's uh, helmet? I, I wore a, and my crew always wore a regular infantry helmet. That's because my first commander of the tank got hit well, uh, by a sniper. And we had him getting out of the tank then. And at the beginning, we had to figure out how to get, a, get him out of the tank. Of course, we figured out to get him out of the uh, escape hatch we had at the bottom. Most people don't know there was like an escape hatch. And what you do is you, get, you open it up, put the person or the dead person's head out, and you move up and you slowly let him out. Then you put the escape hatch out, pull up a while, and then he's out of the open. It's easy, easier that way than trying to get him out of the top of the tank. That's, that's why we wore, we only wore infantry hel helmets. Because I, well, I don't know. Anyways, let's get over with the war. Sorry. Oh, man. Sorry about that. That's all right. <laughs> uh, you 
Is it on? Oh, oh it's on. Yes. It's on. It's rolling. It's ready. It's ready? Okay. And then we got orders. Oh, yeah, I forgot the that position that, uh, that was warm and stuff like that. I fainted like a chicken there. I couldn't understand. All of a sudden, I went down. And then I realized what it was. With the heat and the smell, most people don't realize. The fire, you see a flame come out of the side of the tank when you shoot. That doesn't affect us. But what does affect us is the smell of the gunpowder. Between that and the heat, I came over. I, I didn't realize what the hell, you know. Now, it's things like that I remember. All right, then we moved on. Later on, in the, we got into the Black Forest. In the Black Forest there, one of my uh, famous stops was uh, Gorm, uh, Herman, uh, Herman Go Goring's hunting palace. Herman Goring's hunting palace was made all the way around with a lot of glass. This you can check out probably in the books and stuff like that. Here we have uh, a whole company of men in a place like that. The first thing that amazed me was it was already stripped. He had, he had showcases lined up in the big living room or whatever it was, but they were empty with his trophies he, he must have taken out. The main amazing thing is that the bathroom. I was never used so an updated bathroom because they had two. One you, you did your, uh, the, your, your session on. The other one was for uh, the woman to clean herself out after an intercourse. I can use that word, can't I? <laughs> but of course, the men, being all that men in there, we had to use everything we could possibly have. So we, they used that too. The next thing I got, I got worried is, and I don't know why they always came to me, is there's a safe down in the basement. Besides a, uh, a wine cellar, there was a safe down there. It was a nice size safe. So what I did uh, was go down and look at it there, and, and I told them I'll be right back. I still carried some of that uh, dynamite, that, but it wasn't the dynamite, it was that uh, putty stuff. Oh, C4. C4. These guys look better than me. T4. So I took the T4, ran it around the edge of the safe, like I was taught, put it in the, uh, 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 the detonator, attached the cord to it. Didn't know how much it's going to blow, but I really blew that thing off the hinges and everything. Inside there was everything. There was diamonds galore. I'm telling you, if I kept all of it, I would have been one of the wealthiest men in the country. <laughs> I took a uh, diamond stick pin with a swastika on it. I took a, 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 a ring. I took earrings. I took a necklace with diamonds on it. And I figured, well, if I ever get that home, I'm made. But then, as we moved on, they, we had orders to take five towns each day. It was only a couple of towns. But if there was, if there was, if there was, wasn't any white flags out, and if we got shot at, we were to return the fire and level the town. At this time, my infantry was also volunteers out of the uh, out of a colored outfit. They gave me three of the best soldiers I ever had in my life. And I had been attached to the 82nd, the 1st Division, the 29th Division, the 30th Division. These guys were fabulous. We, went up, we, we set up a system. I'd go through town to one end. 
the other tag would stay up there. The other tag, tag would stay up there too. We had two tags. If we had any opposition, we'd start firing right away. If they didn't fire us, these guys from the infantry went in. And it was, I'd never seen anything like it. You would think it was a football game and they were carrying footballs. Instead, they were carrying hand grenades. And they went in. And they didn't know. We didn't get fired on. They still threw the hand grenades. But the way they operated was like as if they were on a track field and stuff like that. Hop, house to house, and I would see that. Then I, then, but then, there was no combat and stuff like that. Then we'd, uh, we'd come in, and we'd take a break. If we were hungry, and the Germans were there, the pop, you know, the civilians. But first thing I ask him, Machen Sie me kartoffels. Kartoffel is pancakes, potato pancakes. <laughs> See, I, I, I was also like an interpreter. Oh, I forgot to tell you why we were going out on, on, on stuff like that. And if I saw a, a prisoner coming back, I would jump out of the tank while I was moving. I told them I'll catch up to them. I would grab the German prisoner with, with the airfield gang. I'm one of the guys that carried a dagger tied to my shoe, my boot. One of the first things I would do is pull out the dagger, grab the German that was probably bigger than me, and bring him in towards the dagger. And then I would ask him, V is the, uh, in Joe's there, but they knew it. V is the uh, Spitzpanzer. Panzer. Uh, and most of the times they told me. I don't think they hesitated if there was spit pads and stuff like that. Well, another guy? Another guy. Well, well, anyways, I also did the torturing, being that I was in intelligence. I had to know what the hell was in front of me. Uh, all right. We'd take five towns there, and those were my glory days there. One night we pulled into a town there. I got hold of a, uh, the woman, that, uh, wasn't a woman, nice girl, was a school teacher. We threw a party that night. The colored guys stood guard on my tank. As a matter of fact, with them there, I didn't have to say guard on the tank anymore. I showed them how to use the gun and everything and how to, uh, uh, to call me. I started sleeping in a bed for a change. The, uh, we threw a party. What do you think we did? We played spinning the bottle. And we had a good time. It great the pressure. We, ought to, we, we should have had more stops like that. Okay, the, the war ended there. I, uh... Got, got, oh, before the war ended, and I got some prisoners out. One guy was from Coney Island that was working on one of the farms. Everybody, they, you, you know, you hear about uh, prison camps, but you also hear about them working on farms, slave labor. Mm -hmm. So this guy from, uh, uh, got out, uh, and he was alongside of my tank. And I was talking to him, and, and I says, you're going to go home right away. You want to take back some stuff and I'll give you some? He says, yeah. And I gave him the diamonds. So I hope, he, that's how stupid I was. I gave, gave him the diamonds and I got his address and telephone number that I kept with the diamonds. Okay, that was that story. <laughs> Continue on. I, I, I got a, uh, an Indian with the turban on that was also working on, on the farms, you know? And I started to talk to him. He says, he wants to go home. C can I help him? I stop a woman on a bicycle. Take the bicycle, give it to him. He says, uh, well, the rabbi shook me. I was carrying a shotgun that was an antique. It was a double barrel shotgun with a rifle 
in metal on the top of it. See, I knew about guns. And I gave it to him. And I, and I wished him a, a, a good trip. That was the, about, the, I can remember my fighting. But the fighting wasn't over. The war was over. And we still made night attacks and stuff like that there because they had what they called, the, the, their, their underground was, was the wolf something or other. And they, we were afraid they were going to organize and start fighting. So I used to, we used to make night raids whenever we got warned that a group was sent. One Sunday, they put me on the, uh, in front of the church. I want you to know, I got the brunt of everything. In front of the church, because three people were not to, not allowed to gather on the outside. So I had to stay there in front of the church and break up the people from gathering. That, that hurt me, you know. I was doing it this, but, but the th things like that there. Then another time, German kid comes over me. I don't think it was about eight years old. The war is over. And I was one of the first ones home. I'll get to that. The war is over. And he says, jetzt noch die, noch die, the, um, Ruskies. In other words, now we should go fight the Russians. Things like that you don't forget. I look at them. Didn't they fight enough? Uh, we're going to have to stop. Yeah, stop it. I've had enough. I, I got home. I had uh, about 65 points. We were still fighting in the... Uh, in the... Uh, Japan? In the South... Uh, yeah. In the Pacific? In Japan. While I was on the high seas there. Uh, at, when I got shipped home, nobody ever interviewed what the hell I did. My... Uh, the uh, the uh, captain from my outfit. I want to know. I'm going to say here truly, I fought a war without officers. I saved my officer, lieutenant, life because when I came back, and, and this is I, I, sh I don't have time. I got to tell you, but we moved in a position there, and we, I knew that the officer. Was, uh, was in the uh, town. I found him in, in town there. When I got in there, I seen him sitting at a, at a, a table there with, with the whiskey in front of him, smoking a cigar, having a drink, in a nice chair and things like that. All the mail piled up by the, by the wall and the food piled up there. I put my finger on the, on the carbine. I held it on my side and I was thinking, should I shoot him now? I didn't shoot him, I saved his life, and he knew it. Because later on, when we went to the Raw, oh, this is during the Raw Valley, we moved out on the highway, the, the, uh, here in the uh, highway there, we were moving out there. His Jeep was right in front of me. I kept picking up on him. <laughs> I, scared, I scared the hell out of him. He got out came over and got me out of driving the jeep, the uh, tank. See, I did everything. I drove radio operator and stuff like that because I, all the training I got. I got back in the States. Everybody got a day off to go home. I didn't. I was CQ, charge of quarters in uh, New Jersey there, the Camp Kilmore. But I was lucky. While I was sleeping, a girl, uh, what's it, uh, a whack, woke me up. I grabbed her. <laughs> we had a fight. <laughs> and that, that's why I, I remember all this. This, oh yes, and then my father came visit me while I was still in the Camp Kilmore. I was loaded with guns. See, I was a collector and a seller. Mm -hmm. That I box. Anyways, I goaded up whatever I could, the swords, everything, into my father's valise he bought for me. I figured they're going to stop me. They wouldn't stop the old man.
he got my all the guns back. Now, and I, you, when were you discharged finally? I was uh, discharged in Kilwa. I think it was Kilwa. Yeah, Kil, uh, Kilwa. Uh -huh. uh, you want the date? I, can, I don't really remember uh, the date. But I told you, I put in four years. Uh -huh. That's enough. Okay, well, we're going to have to stop. All right. Yeah, it's enough. Thank you very much.